Now, B part 2 of the question says construct um, an equation for this reaction. That means they want the overall redox reaction which will happen between these two. Now, it's quite simple actually and this is one of the very repeated questions which comes in the exam. So, it's good to have the skill there. All you have to do, first of all, um, again using the previous concept, you, you know this is your cathode and that's the anode. So, always remember, you need to flip the anode equation the other way around because that anode electrons are lost. So we need to write the equation in that way, showing the loss of electrons. The cathode equation just copied, it gets copied as it is from the other booklet. So I'm going to keep this equation as it is. I'm going to flip this equation the other way around. The other thing which I have to do is match the number of electrons. I have six electrons there and I have two electrons there. So I need to work this out. I have to make the electrons equal. So I have to multiply the whole equation by three to make it equal to 6. That's an important step, otherwise the answer won't be right. So two things, flipping the equation the other way and also multiplying by 3. So I've written the molecular formula there, so I'm going to use that. So that's C10H8O3, that's this one, molecular formula. You could count the atoms and confirm. And uh, we're turning that into C10H6O3 then I also have uh, two H plus and I have two electrons. So that's the, the flipped out equation of this one. Now I need to times this by three to adjust the electrons. So I'm gonna multiply this by three. So three here, three here, and that becomes equal to six, and that becomes equal to six, which can then help me to cancel these two electrons, or these six electrons there. So all I have to do now is add these two equations and that will give me my final answer. So why don't you try? Uh, cancel out anything else if you notice. I have 14 H pluses here and 6 H pluses there. So I can cancel 6 of these. and with, So I have 8 H plus left on this side. So the final answer would be this plus this plus this should give you this. It's all gone here. Plus this plus this. That's how you get the final answer. So. Um, that would be CR, if you just copy from there, CR2072 minus plus 8H plus, then I have 3C10H8O3, and then I move to that side, I have 2CR3 plus plus 7H2O, and then I also have 3C10H6O3. So that's, that's the answer of this question. So don't forget the two important skills to adjust who's your anode and cathode. And once you do that, flip the anode, times it by the appropriate number to adjust the electrons. Sometimes you may even have to multiply both the equations by appropriate numbers to adjust the electrons. Cancel the electrons out, cancel whatever you can, if anything else cancel out. Whatever's left is a final equation. Okay, we are now getting into B part three of the question. Now, if you look at the data given in this question, they give you the information about the volume of A, 20 cm cube. They also give you concentration of K2Cr2O7, potassium dichromate, 0 0.05 mole per dm cube. And that's the amount of potassium dichromate which was used to completely react with A. Using all that information, the examiner asks students to work out the concentration of A. This is a very, very typical um, two or three step calculation and it follows a very simple logical order. And this is one of the skills that you know you should develop and make it very, very strong because this is a very, very repeatedly asked concept. So how to start the question? Well, if you look at the information there, you have the concentration, you have the volume. So the first thing that should strike you is I can use the concentration and the volume to figure out the moles of CR207 2 minus. So I can use that to find moles of CR207 2 minus using the formula n equals to C times V. So my concentration is 0 0.05, the volume is 7.50. But don't forget I can't use CM cube. I need to divide this by 1000 to change into DM cube. And we work this out and the answer that you will get will be 3.75 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 uh, moles. Just work it out, just check if you've got the same answer or not. 
Now, once you get the moles of Cr2 or 7, 2 minus, the next step is to figure out the moles of A. Now, this depends on how accurate your answer of the previous question was. So, if you look at your previous uh, question where you actually got the overall equation, try to look at the ratio between the Cr2 or 7 and A. If you look at the ratio, it should work out to be 1 ratio 3. So, the ratio between Cr2 or 7, 2 minus and A, A actually was, uh, if you look at A, it was C10H8O3. This was basically A. If you look at the equation there and you work out it's 1 ratio 3 from the equation. And I have the actual moles underneath, so I have 3.75 into 10 to the power minus 4. So that's going to be x. A simple cross multiplication will get you the answer. So try to work the answer out and see what you get. So basically x equals to that times that and if you do that you should get uh, 1.125 into 10 raised to the power negative 3 moles. Okay then, you got the moles of A. Now don't forget you got the moles of A and you already have the volume of A. So you have everything what you need to find out the concentration. So to find the concentration of A, the concentration of A, C equals to uh, uh, if you have, you know the formula is n equals to c into v, so basically c equals to n by v. So I have the moles 1.125 into 10 to the power minus 3. That's my moles. The volume is 20 cm cube. But don't forget, I cannot use 20. I need to divide this by 1000, so I divide this by 1000. Well, why don't you work this answer out and get your final answer? It should come out to be uh, 5.63 into 10 to the power minus 2. So just check 5.63 into 10 to the power minus 2 mole per dm cube. Uh, once again, a quick re recap. First thing what we did, we got the moles of Cr2072 minus n equals to C into V. I had all the data with me. So that's, I used that data to figure out the moles. And once I got the moles, uh, I used the mole ratio to get the moles of A. And once I get the moles of A by multiplying by 3, I use the formula C equals to N by V. So I have my N, I have my V, and don't forget the volume always has to be in DMQ. That's it, very straightforward calculation question. Now, uh, looking at C part, we have lots of information there. We have the, um, the compound loss in again, and we, this is being reacted with sodium hydroxide to form this compound there. Now, if you look at the difference between the two, the OH uh, has changed into ONA, and uh, now this compound B is supposed to be reacted with CH3COCl. This is ethanol chloride, the acid chloride class. And the examiner says, what do you think would be the structure of C? When, uh, when these two react, you'll notice that the Na plus here can combine with the Cl here. So I, I can remove my Na and Cl and I can just connect this CO to that. So I just copy out the structure as it is. That's the benzene ring. That's double bond O, double bond O. That remains O. Now remember, I removed the Na and the Cl, and I'm going to connect this CO here. So that's C double bond O. So you see this, that's a nice and easy ester there. And what's left is the CH3. So that's the structure of C. So a very simple compound there. Don't forget, that the only thing what you have to do is remove the Cl and remove the Na and just join them together and that's the compound. That's the ester there. Now, in C part 2 of this question, the examiner says D is an isomer of C and um, it's basically some kind of an isomer in which it, everything should be the same, all functional groups should be the same and, as in C but in different positions. So the question clearly tells you what to do, so there's not much of a confusion there. That means you will not change the esters, you will not change the ketone, you will not change the alkene, but just change their positions around, that's it. So it's kind of a positional isomerism that you study in AS level. So to make isomer of this, what I could do is I have the, so I can, that, that double bond O remains there, I can switch this there. So I'm going to put the double bond there. I'm just going to bring that thing down here. So if I'm going to do that, so that's O. 
C double bond O CH3. I just swap the position up and down. Now the thing is I can't continue to put the double bond there. If I do that the carbon's valency won't be satisfied. So I shift to the double bond this side. And that explains all carbon's valency. Don't forget carbon has four bonds. So you need to make sure that that particular thing is not disturbed. So if you put the double bond here, you'll find carbon has more than four bonds and that's not accepted. So that would be the answer of this question. So that's the answer my D. Notice the changes are this shifted there, that came here and that double bond shifted the side. That's the answer there. Now in C part 3, the question says suggest a mechanism for the formation of D, that's this one, the previous answer, from B. That's given in the question. So they want you to change this to this. And they want you to show all possible, all mechanism, all curly arrows, whatever you think will happen when this change happens. And uh, mechanism for formation of D from B and ethanol chloride by drawing all relevant structures in curly arrows. Okay, so everything is in, is, has been asked. So let's have a look. So when you begin with B, if you notice, that the double bond has been shifted here and uh, I also noticed that there is a double bond here so I need to create those conditions so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift the now oxygen has um, a pair of electrons don't forget oxygen has a pair of electrons lone pair of electrons so I'm going to switch them here to this one that's the first curly arrow and whenever you make curly arrows make sure it's right in the middle of the bond and I also need to make sure the double bond has shifted here. So I'm going to make one curly arrow going this way. And I see that the double bond has become single bond. So I need to swing one of the bond here to bring this oxygen as negative and that will change into a single bond. Um, when I do that, there's also some charge build up. Don't forget that's going to be partial negative. That will change into single bond there. And uh, that will become a double bond there. And that double bond shifts here. So when my reaction intermediate, if I have to make, it should look like this. That's benzene. So that remains as it is. I have now the second um, ketone group. And that has shifted here. So that's done. That has become single. Okay. And then I have the oxygen there. And there you go. That's the reaction intermediate. Everything is in place. So I have two of these in place. I have this also ready. I just have to now connect this with the ethanol chloride to get to that. So all I have to do is write the structure of CH3COCl down. So that's already given in the question. So I'm, I'm going to prepare the board again. Okay, so once we, once we have the structure, all I have to do is just add the CH3COCl here. So now, once I have my intermediate ready, let's let's have a look at the CH3COCl. So I have my C um, double bond O Cl, and that's my CH3. So um, well, two curly arrows are very important here. One of them will be this way. Chlorine is more electronegative. It pulls the electrons towards it, making it partial positive. Oh, uh, sorry, negative, and the carbon becomes partial positive. And this allows this lone pair of electron to get attracted to that carbon. So these two curly arrows, once they materialize, this eventually this one connects to this carbon. That's the connection there. The oxygen connecting to carbon. That's that one. And the the COCH3. That's the COCH3. So everything is in place. And the Cl obviously goes out. And don't forget the Na plus has gone out, so they combine together to form the NaCl. So that's all the curly arrows what you have to know. Three curly arrows here. One, two, three. And once you have the reaction intermediate, two curly arrows here. One that side and one that side. Five of these. And that's all enough, all that you need to know to get all your full marks there. Now, let's have a look at question 4a. This question says, describe and explain the trend in volatility of halogens chlorine bromine and iodine as you go down the group what happens to that trend and that's a tendency um, for any uh, liquids to change into gas so basically you have to talk about the intermolecular forces so if you look at chlorine bromine and iodine in AS level topic 3 you study that they are all simple molecules and they have weak one to forces in between focus on the intermolecular forces not the one which is inside the molecule but between the molecules 
Now simple molecules, they have van der Waals forces which is controlled by the number of electrons and the kind of surface area they have. More the electrons and they also have more surface area will have more van der Waals forces. So that's what happens here. When, when you move from chlorine to iodine, the number of electron increases and also the surface area increases, they become bigger molecules and that explains why the van der Waals forces also increases. So these are the two major reasons why as you go from chlorine to iodine, the tendency to change into gas decreases, so volatility becomes less. Now, part B1 talks about comparing the boiling point of H2 and H2S. Once again, this question is from your AS level um, topic 3 notes. If you look at the structures, uh, they are simple molecules, they are not macromolecules, but this one has hydrogen bonding and how do we know that because H is bonded with oxygen so H2O has hydrogen bonding between the molecules and uh, H2S is a, also a simple molecule which is also polar but it cannot form H bonding it has the permanent dipole forces but don't forget the hydrogen bond is much more stronger than permanent dipole forces and that's why the boiling point of H2O is much higher you could also show this by a diagram so just for the sake of diagram, I'm just putting two H2 molecules side by side. Oxygen has two lone pairs. So um, this is partial two negative, this is partial positive. And that's basically your hydrogen bond, intermolecular hydrogen bond. Don't forget you need to show your lone pairs there. So between water molecules there is hydrogen bond, but between H2S permanent dipole forces. So that being more stronger you need more energy to break this bond and to make it to boil. That's why it has a higher boiling point. Don't forget how the boiling point lower the volatility. So they are opposite of each other. B part 2. Now if you look at B part 2, we have a case of a simple molecule which is non-polar. Don't forget carbons and hydrogen. Um, they're not exactly very electronegative. So the permanent. there's no permanent dipole. But here this one has oxygen there, extremely electronegative there. That will bring out some polarity in the molecule and the net dipole will not be equal to zero. Uh, don't forget there's an angle around the oxygen, it's not exactly linear so the, the dipoles don't cancel out each other. So that's why this is a polar molecule, that's non-polar molecule. So therefore it, this will have permanent dipole forces and that alkane will have weak van der Waals forces and that's why the boiling point of this compound should be higher compared to that. Now, in part C, the question says, briefly explain the shape of SF6 molecule, drawing a diagram to illustrate your answer. This question is from topic 3, VSCPR notes of your AS level. So, SF6, you know, sulfur has 6 electrons in the outer shell. It's bonding with 6 fluorine. So, it has what is called as an octahedral shape. So, 4 fluorines are in the plane. So there is one electron here, one here, one here and uh, just to highlight the plane, I'm just using dotted lines, it, it gives a good pers perspective of a plane and then I have two of the fluorines above and below the plane. So I have a fluorine here and I have a fluorine here. Uh, the question only talks about the shape so you don't have to really give too much detail of the electrons but if you want to draw a dot cross uh, you could draw the seven electrons of fluorine around each one. So this is just basically what is called as a octahedral shape of SF6. As of now the bond angle inside is 90 and the bond angle between the, uh, the atoms outside above and below the plane to the plane is also 90 degrees. That's basically octahedral. Some old books will call it um, square, pyramid, square planar bipyramidal but uh, the CI prefers octahedral as a simple example. Now let's have a look at question number 5a from the organic chemistry. This is chlorine substituted carboxylic acids, two of them. This one contains two chlorines, this one contains one chlorine. This is 2,2-dichloroethanoic um, acid and this is 2-dichloroethanoic acid. Don't forget the carbon of the carboxylic is the first carbon. Now if you compare the acidity of these two chlorine substituted carboxylic acids, the star point that you must remember, more the chlorine, stronger the acid. That's a very easy way for you to learn. And this one has two chlorines, so that means for, sh for, for certainty, 
this is a much stronger acid than that. If you compare the Ka values, remember in topic 7, higher the Ka, stronger the acid. Now, how to explain this in the exams? Because chlorine is electron withdrawing group. So it's going to pull the electron away. Now, if you just open the display formula of carboxylic acid, it will make some sense to you. Because if you want to talk about the acidity, you need to have a good look at the OH bond. Now, if we have chlorine, which is extremely electronegative, and two of these, which means there's a lot of electron withdrawing pull or tendency happening this side, which means the OH bond here is becoming much weaker. So, which, mean, which means this H very easily can be released as a proton. So there's going to be a pull towards this side. So H is going to lose this proton, uh, electron and go out as a proton. That means that's going to act as a stronger acid. But here, there's only one chlorine. So the amount of electron, uh, electron withdrawing effect is much less compared to this one. So the OH bond here is not as weak as compared to the OH bond here. So this is comparatively a bit more stronger. So therefore, its tendency to release the proton is going to be a bit difficult, not easy, as compared to this one. So more the chlorine, stronger the acid, weaker the OH bond, and that's why it makes it very easy for it to lose the electron. So that's the answer for this question. Okay, in question number five of the organic chemistry, uh, B part, this question talks about some chemical tests with reagent and conditions, which could be used to distinguish between uh, the pairs. Now, I'm going to pick up the first one. Now, the difference between the two, that obviously is the aromatic ring, so that represents phenylamine or aminobenzene. Now, there are two tests what you could use to distinguish between them. The easy test would be if you react this with bromine water. Now, bromine water has an orange, red brown, orange color to it. Now, this one reacts with bromine water, and uh, you find that it undergoes electrophilic substitution reaction, and two or three bromines can come onto the ring. And the product is a white precipitate. Also, the bromine color gets decolorized. But here, there, will be, there won't be any reaction. So that's one good test using bromine water. The other what you could use is, you could use um, NaNO2 plus HCl. And uh, so this compound changes into benzene diazonium chloride. The NH2 will change into N2Cl, benzene diazonium chloride. And then you could react this with um, phenol. If you react this with phenol, and phenol must be dissolved in NOH and kept in cold conditions, uh, what you get is a compound called azodyes. So an azodye, um, they, they are brightly colored pigments. They're used in textile industry to provide color. So the azodye will, will look something like this. Uh, this would be an azodye. That's the azo bridge. So th it has a bright orange color, this particular azodye. And, but in this case, there will not be any reaction. So that's a too easy visible test. So the first test is bromine water, uh, white precipitate, and bromine water gets decolorized. Um, and the second um, test for this one would be uh, converting the amino benzene into um, benzene diazonium chloride by the reaction of NaNO2 and HCl and then subsequent reaction followed by phenol dissolved in NOH and to get an azo compound remember that's the